Hi everyone, my name is James Ivy with McDSP and you join me in a very sunny North London with uh, scoring engineer, mixing engineer type person, Mr. Mark Wilshire. Hello. Uh, Mark, thanks for having us. It's fantastic to be in your relatively new room. It's beautiful in here uh, to talk about all things APB. Uh, first of all, I'd like to dive in and um, comment on the number of monitors we have around here. And I don't just mean the image ones. APB in surround? Uh, that's right. We have uh, this right now we're in a 5 1 setup. Uh, sometimes we're in a 7 1 setup. And there are, um, and there are two uh, subwoofers, LFE channels in the room as well. It sounds amazing in here, but now my experience of all things APB has been purely stereo. So. Can you explain a little bit about the the adaption, if any, or the the conversion or the any altering of workflow you had to go through to make APB talk surround? Uh, well, you know, fortunately, there really wasn't anything um, That's to good. do differently um, than I would normally do. I mean, it's one of the things I love about the APB is that it, it's it's really changed nothing about my workflow. It just you know gives me a new tool, gives me new qualities. Um, new colors um, and that's that's great in terms of surround i mean it's the same really the same in terms of mixing in stereo in terms of timbre and and the quality and it's not i wouldn't say it's it's sort of different in that respect i mean it's all about tone and tone and balance and i think that's one of the things that we love about all things apb it is about the tone it's about getting back to that analog realism, grit, and all those sort of phrases we love to use about analog gear and tubes and valves, depending on where you're from. Um, so we're going to dive into this session a little bit um, and sort of kind of show us a little bit of your workflow stuff, a little bit of some of the APB stuff that you really like. Um, I know you're particularly proud of a request that then got turned into reality incredibly quickly by Colin and the team. <laughs> Uh, that's right, and that was a, that was a request that uh, immediately uh, made me purchase a second APB, um, which was that I really wanted a um, a surround uh, limiter. Um, not because I specifically wanted surround limiting, but I wanted the the tone that I can get from from the APB um, in a situation I could use on a multi microphone um, orchestra pass. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's sort of if I'm you know if maybe one pass of, of strings or strings and winds is 32, 40 microphones. Um, I can't put an APB on every single one, um, but I can put it on the bus yeah. um, if I have the, a surround version of it. Um, and Colin very quickly, um, I mean, it was, I don't think it was two months from when I asked him about the possibility of creating a, a surround version of one of the plugins that um, he, he sent me a prototype of the L18 um, in surround. Um, and it's great. I use it all the time. Unfortunately, I'm not using it in the stuff I'm showing you today, um, but uh, but I do use it regularly with um, live orchestral material. It's also worth saying that for obvious reasons, you're probably listening to us in stereo. So anything that is um, in 5.1 is going to be lost on YouTube. Sorry about that. Uh, we're folding it all down to stereo. Um, but I think it's, this is more about a workflow thing and the yes. fact that it just works. That's right. There's no big kind of conversion or hang-ups or shakes to go through and convert what is effectively stereo processing and make it work in a 5.1, 7.1, or if you've got the APB processing channels, an Atmos or Atmos, depending on where you're from, um, workflow. Yep. I think that's very, very cool. So let's dive in and let's have a look and listen to what's going on. Sure. So this session I've got here today is, is, um, is from a television series, um, a New Zealand show about two cricket players. Um, and uh, the, the main reason I showed this is because this is something that is actually released um, since I've had the APBs, which a lot of stuff isn't uh, because of COVID. Um, but uh, and then the other good thing about this is this has a pretty broad variety of material. It's, it's one composer, um, but it's got um, there are heavy metal tracks in here, which I'm probably not going to play. There are some Beach Boys style tracks. Mm -hmm. um, there's orchestral material. Um, so it's a pretty good variety to show show some different things. And um, 
you know, one of the things that will probably come out a lot of the time is that the, you know, for me, this really is, it's not so much about raw compression. You know, this type of material, I'm not doing any heavy compression. You're not going to see meters sliding all over the place and things (laughs) getting pinned. Um, It's much more subtle. Um, And, uh, you know, in terms of the the tactileness and the the timbre of the sound. And and also a lot of this stuff is samples. Um, and, uh, And some of the, you know, some of the nice things about even just motion in the performance of the samples um is that there's a qualities that the apb rings out very easily um that sort of give it a more more life i actually had one of the things that made me convinced that i had made the right choice in in getting the apb um and that i wasn't fooling myself was when a client actually called me at one point and asked me if i'd had someone in and replaced one of the tracks with a real player wow um because (laughs) because they couldn't believe that what they were getting back was what they had what they had wow, sent me cool. um so that was that was a pretty pretty solid endorsement um but let, let's look at this um this track here i guess probably the the easiest thing to do is um maybe before i play this because some of this might be a little new to people um this session is set up pretty much how i would mix a score or a television show i'm always mixing into stems so this what we're looking at on the screen right now is actually the print of this this mix. So there are, there are 12 stems that um, at the later stage of, of the f- mixing this in with dialogue and, and sound effects mm-hmm. can be manipulated if need be. There is a the full mix, which is my 5-1 mix. And then there's the stereo mix here, which is what everyone will be hearing on YouTube, which is actually a slightly altered... Um, it's not a straight fold down of the 5-1. I do the way I'm set up all of the stems actually go through a separate set of stereo bus. All the stems are folded down individually. Some slight EQ filter changes are made to them and then balanced into this, this stereo version, which is what I call the, the soundtrack mm-hmm. uh, yeah. mix. Um, and then, uh, you know, basically because of this, then all these instrument groups are divided up into different areas. And I have multiple, all of these tra- all of these auxes are all, reverbs, effects, delays, anything else I'm using. So every stem has its own set of discrete effects because obviously if I'm print, I want to be able to print in a single pass and have all of these stems with all their own associated effects and nothing is overlapping, um, which is one of the nice things with obviously the computer workflow compared to the way I started out is that I don't have to do things in separate yeah. passes to get it all isolated. It's just set up that way. Um, so it's very fast, and it's one of the one of the things that's great about the APB is that I don't have to um, I don't have to change anything. I can get all the goodness that I used to get out of classic analog gear with this automated, you know, completely recallable workflow. Let's just dive in, and I'll I'll just play this one track, and then I'll go back and show where I'm using the APB. Um, unfortunately, this this material which I'm playing. If I were to redo it, I'd probably use more channels of APB. Mm-hmm. Um, I only had one APB um, when I did this. Um, and you've got two 16s. I have two 16s. I have 32 channels, um, which feels about enough. But on on bigger projects, and if I am using the surround versions, obviously things get eaten up very, so on very the, fast. The surround limiter, you're actually using six Six channels. channels. So five and the sub. Right. Wow. Awesome. That's right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm probably going to end up having more, um, but for now, 32 channels is, um, is definitely delivering. All right. So here's uh, this is, this is sort of a Beach Boys-esque, uh, style track, um, that is actually mostly samples, um, but, uh, but still with the APB's help sounds, uh, sounds pretty good. <laughs> Classic cue. Manhattan um, in terms transfer of in samples. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Um, so, and this, this um, even though you're, you're looking at the screen on the printed tracks, um, we are actually listening to the mix live. Um, I have the oddly, um, rarely used um, Pec Direct visuals in Pro Tools. So the fact that these are not lit green um, actually means they're on input. Right. If they're green, um, it's the playback. So yeah. we we are listening to the mix live. Let's look at the uh, let's look at the the snare first, actually, um, which has a um, has a mute tube on it. Um, as I don't tend to, as I said, use heavy amounts of compression on this stuff. Um, when I I've, I've sort of as I the more I do, I tend to find certain of these circuits work well for me with certain types of instrumentations. And it may not be that I want the specific way they're doing the compression, mm -hmm. but I just like the timbre yeah. of, this, of, the, of, the, of whatever it is coming through these. Um, and as a quick aside, actually, I had, um, I had a completely different turn of things. Um, back at the beginning of this year, um, I mastered a, a um, period Cooper album mm -hmm. um, for a colleague. Um, that they were um, they were just unhappy with the sounds of these baroque flutes, mm -hmm. um, and the recording sounded really good. And um, you know, I listened to it and I thought, you know, if the L eighteen is really just going to give this a little more realism, a little more sort of nice quality to the mid range. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, that is not there. And I, so I did very subtle processing through the L18. I sent it back. I didn't say anything. And it was hilarious because this friend of mine, um, this is Jack Vad, who worked uh, as an engineer for the San Francisco Symphony for many years, um, called me back and it's like, did you run this through a bunch of transformers or something? Um, and it was kind of funny because, you know, he was, he, the, the artist who'd been on it was, was, was very happy, but also very confused. And he was very confused because Jack couldn't tell him what I'd done. And he was so used to always hearing like, oh, it's like this EQ or this shelf or this, you know, something else. And in this, he's like, I, I don't know what Mark did. He, he put it through this box he's got and, mm -hmm. and it's better. Um, and that's actually how I would say, as a, just as an aside, what I would sum up my experience with the APB a lot of the time is that it, it just, I'm just happier. It makes um, it better. It just makes it better. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, and and part of what I like is the, I mean, is even in some of the some of these, like the the Royal Mew is a good example. Even just just going through the through that and raising the gain with it um, gives it is a, very pleasing. A thing. It's um, funny. It must have been twenty odd years ago. I was talking to one of the guys who was the importer distributor for GML, and he said. Even on bypass, this thing makes it sound better. Yeah. Because there was no such thing as true bypass. The electronics, even in yeah. bypass, they're having an effect. They're loading the signal in a certain way. Yeah. And this is the same. Exactly. Obviously, bypass is bypass, but with all the, the, the controls set to either unity or off or the defaults, right. it's doing a thing and it's doing a lovely thing. Exactly. So. What I'll do is I'll just play the snare bypassed soloed first. Um, it's going to be, it will be softer. Um, but I think the, the main thing, well, I'll play it and then we'll talk about yeah. it. So. Now, you know, for me, you know, raw like that is kind of a little scary. But it's, it does what it needs to in the track, mm -hmm. but it's not very inspiring. Um, and what's, you know, is, is here, I'll just put the Mutu in here. Those little drags in that, yeah. that are just being brought up to a really nice, yeah, human level the way the way you'd actually play it. Yeah, no, I mean it's like it, it's a di it's a different world. But even just aside from that, aside from being louder, just there's something about the core of the sound that I find in a lot of these in a lot of these things, and we'll hopefully see in the moment when I play the bass, is that you know one of the things, especially in low end, 
that I've always found with within the box is that it's never like the best example I can have, and unfortunately I don't have anything here to show it, is like heavily distorted guitars mm -hmm. mixed in, in, in the computer have never sounded as good. You know, as like what ends up, I always end up finding that I have to do a lot of EQ mm -hmm. to drop stuff out so that stuff just doesn't get too thick yeah. and too messy. Whereas, and what's interesting with that kind of stuff is with this stuff, I can have the meat without it getting thick and messy. Yeah. Um, and that's the kind of thing, like here, there's so much more meat to that snare. I mean, part of it is obviously that it's louder, but if I did the same compression with a different compressor, it's not going to have that sort of, like I can reach out and grab it quality. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be flat on the page, so to speak, as, as it was when it was bypassed. Um, and then it's a little hard because of the, the volume difference, but if I play it in the track here. So that's with, you know, just balanced in as mm -hmm. bypassed. And then if I put it back in the way it is. I mean, to me, it just sounds like a real drum now. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, closer. Well, closer. <laughs> but well, I mean, it, it is a real drum. Yeah, but yeah. you know, I mean, it, yeah. it sounds more. It it just is more. For me, it's it's the difference between I'm listening to a recording mm -hmm. and the instruments are there. Yeah. Um, and that which is always my goal. My goal is always to if I close my eyes, I can imagine that. Yeah. The, it's not the speakers. It's not in this room. It's the 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 the, mu the music is being performed. So we'll go up to the bass, and, and you know it's funny here because the, the MooTube is is not actually the one of the plugins I use, or you know that I use that much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I do tend to use it on snare, and I do tend to use it on bass. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said on the other stuff, it's not particularly that. I like the controls or I specifically like the the compression itself over some of the other options. It's just that the quality it gives to the range of these instruments feels good to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so this this here, we can go, we can listen to this bass here again. It's unfortunately with this stuff, it's world of television. It's all all samples. Um, so here's the, the original bass without the, the tube. Sounds okay. Sounds like Trillion. Yep. Which is probably what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here we go again with the MuTube. It's like you can hear finger grit, isn't it? You, yeah. You can hear the skin right. against the string. Well, and, and that's exactly the kind of thing that to me is you know, and it obviously completely varies on what instrument it is, but that's the kind of thing that then it immediately becomes more real to me. Mm -hmm. It's not a radical change in this case, but it's enough of a change that it's more, it, it's just more real. It's more like it's there rather than it is synthetic. It's, it's funny. Um, we plan these things in advance, of course, to a certain extent, but I didn't realize Mark was going to talk quite so much about YouTube. The, what's funny is I think... I, I don't I don't know this for certain, but to me it's as close a representation of a Summit TL one hundred uh -huh. as I've ever heard in quote unquote software because right. it's obviously software and hardware. Yeah. But it's it's doing that thing that I love that hardware unit for, yeah. and I've been trying to find the hardware, <laughs> an, an old one, right. and then I had this revelation. I thought, no, I don't actually need one. I've got 16 of them already <laughs> right? because it does work particularly well for bass yeah. and it works particularly well for fattening up 
snare and under snare as well. If you mm -hmm. want, if you don't just want that pointless under snare sizzle, you want a bit of the crack of the drum of the shell. It works so well for that, and actually this works. Mutu works really well in that sort of environment where you yep. want to fatten something up. You don't necessarily want to hear quote unquote compression. Yeah, you just want it bigger. No, absolutely, and that's it's, it's just funny because th this this track for some reason that I decided to play this one first, um, it just happens that on this that there are only three things I'm using APB on, and two of them have the Mutu. Um, but uh, but it's certainly like in in orchestral material, I don't think I've ever used the Mutu. Right. Um, but uh, but in this type of stuff, it, it's really really great. Um, so then the other thing, you know, unfortunately, even though this track features so much vocal there is actually no APB on the vocal um, and as I said if I did redid this I probably would use it a little bit but what you can't hear on YouTube unfortunately with the vocals is that the vocals are all spread around mm -hmm. and a lot of the rhythmic vocals are all in the back yeah um, and it's a very much a spatial thing um, I'm which... sat in the wrong place but even from here it sounds crazy as the vocals are moving around right um, so let's look at the um, let's look at this piano here. Now this, and again, this is just something that sort of as I've used it more and more, the chicken head is tends to always be my first reach for piano. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't matter what kind of piano it is. Um, for some reason, this just works. And then the nice thing also about this plugin that I really like, which Colin has on several of these plugins are different tone controls and like in this case this sauce button because I like these things where I can dial stuff in and I can be happy and then I can just have do I want this or do I want this and I just go with whatever feels better yeah um and I don't you know I don't it, it, it sort of it allows me to spend those types of things it's like the L18 at some point I'll I'm going to find something that's got the L18 on it with the color control mm -hmm. is that I don't have to overthink it I can get it where I feel good about it, and then I can just, you know, play with it and feel where where does this feel right, mm -hmm. um, and it's just easy, um, which I, I just I, I love that. Um, strangely enough, here this has the sauce button in. I tend to not use the sauce button right. a lot, but, um, but I think sauce I, does something magical to the top and bottom end, yeah, and does does something kind of not too much in the middle right. but if you've got a signal that does have a lot of mid yeah. it does a thing yeah that's i don't know what it does i know sometimes i like it sometimes i don't on electric yeah. guitars right i always want source right no i'm exactly the same way because when i don't like it it's what it's doing to the mid-range and the low mid-range mm -hmm. um you know and again like exactly like you said sometimes it's great and sometimes it's and sometimes it's so subtle you can't tell. Yeah. But it's very pro like all things in mixing, it's very program dependent. Yeah. But yeah, source and the color button in the L18 are very similar. Yeah. Not in their functionality, but in my my use of them. Yes. So here's the, here's in the same track. Here's the this is piano with the compressor bypass. Um, so let's unbypass this now and see what we're doing here. I mean, that, that's, <laughs> now chalk. Yeah, cheese. And I don't know that I couldn't achieve the same thing with entirely digital plugins. But what I do know for certain is it would take me a lot longer. And time is really important. Because um, no one ever, you know, I don't, t like my clients, I don't tell them about it. But since I've had these, I have had comments back from the clients that reinforce sort of that I'm not imagining things because I want to. I think you're absolutely right. It's just on that piano part, it made that piano part go from, oh, it's a, uh, sample library to being, oh, that's actually a really passable piano in the room with right. mics on. It's bringing out some 
grit, some reality. As I said earlier on, off camera, it's the seasoning. Yes. That just takes it from being a really good dish to being a beautifully seasoned, finished dish. Yes. Uh, as Gordon Ramsay would say, restaurant quality. Yeah. <laughs> He'd probably swear at the same time, but that's not nice <laughs> <story. laughs> Um, so I just, I just one more time. I'm going to play this piano again, um, but I'm just going to play it. Um, I'll play it bypassed in the track, and then un unbypassed. <laughs> Um, what I love about this is that I find that, and this is actually a great example with this piano, is that I can make much meatier mixes. And that I find when, when I'm using this, and it's, as I mentioned to you before we started recording, I feel like I tend to use it almost more like a console in that it's like signals are going through, through it. And, and if I had, you know, there's almost nothing that I wouldn't put through it. Um, even if I didn't need compression. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there's something about the, you know, I find that I'm, I have to do a lot less EQ in the mid-range and the low mid-range to allow for clarity of things. Mm -hmm. When I'm using this, I can get more meat, more structure to the sounds without then having to clear things out to get clarity in the mix overall, um, which is just... Which again, also aside from, to my ears, sounding better, um, it's also faster, um, and and I, I think that is it's hard to. I mean, on the one hand, when you know a lot of people like, I mean, a lot of people are whatever type of studio you have. I mean, a lot of people are working at home, working in their own spaces, and you know, time is not as critical as when you're going into an expensive studio. Um, but it is still like, you know, if I can spend, you know, eight hours doing a mix, and I can spend easily four hours and do a better job with the APB. I mean, that's just my own reality. Maybe it means I'm not as good as I would like to think I might be, but it, it saves me so much time and, and ultimately just means that it's better. I, I don't think it matters how you achieve the end result. No. I think. As I say we're all working in some might call it compromised environments i don't consider this compromised at all i think it's fantastic and we've been talking about um shedios yes. for, for lack of a better phrase as well but i think now the the cottageization of the industry as is, as it's been quoted is a reality you know, garden sheds, home offices, home studios are reality now. Not everyone can go to Skywalker or into Soho and have a multi-million pound mix facility at their disposal. Nor, these days, is it required. You know, it is totally doable at home with the level of kit that the guys at the big spaces have because that's just the way it's happened. But APB has meant that we can have right. our racks of desirable That's outboard right. in two rack spaces. Well, and and like you said, I mean, even though, I mean, it's obviously having the two of those is not cheap um, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but when I think about, like, when I think about the, the outboard that I used to use and have, and what it would cost to have 32 channels of like GML and Neve and Summit with the high-end converters to get them in and out, I don't think I would achieve a better result. And it would cost a lot more. Yeah. And I wouldn't have the instant recall. Yeah, absolutely. Or the ability to automate it. Mark, at this point, I would reach out and but COVID and all that prohibits that. So I'm going to say thank you so much for inviting us into your fabulous studio and showing us all around your APB workflow. My pleasure. So I really hope you enjoyed that. My name's James Ivey with McDSP and I will see you again very soon.